I've titled today's message as Is there a Jonathan and a Nathan in your life? It's very interesting, isn't it? Is there a Jonathan and a Nathan in your life? See, the way God changed the pattern from the Old Testament to the New Testament is He built up a body of believers. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God used to come upon an individual and he used to accomplish what God purposed for his people. But when it came to the New Testament, now God started using something called the church. Now the church is nothing but the bride of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 says, Through the church his intent was to let the world know, the, the principalities and powers know the uh, wisdom of God the manifold wisdom of God so God is using an agency called the church now in the church there are several things that happen the composition of a church is uh, the early church is the best example Acts 2.42 says they followed what? an apostle's doctrine fellowship prayer and breaking of bread so, one of the most important uh, things out of these four is the fellowship. Now today we are going to talk about in the fellowship, in your personal life, what you need. What kind of people do you need in a fellowship? People have different definitions of fellowship. But today we are going to look at David's life and see how two important people played a key role in forming him to what he became. Let me tell you something very clearly. Today, if I ask you, in your Christian life, tell me five names of, uh, names of five people who you cannot forget, who really fashioned in the formation of your spiritual life. I'm sure you'll be able to give me those five names. All of us. Now, those people, were they really preachers? May not be. Were they top-notch people? Were they deacons? Were they people having any position, authority? May not be. They might be ordinary people in the church, but what God does is, He makes use of these people to help fashion your spirituality. I have learned so many things from many men of God. There have been some people who have really challenged my spirituality at one point of time. Today if I look back in my 21 and a half years of Christian life, I can tell you that those people in my church were not big people. They were regular believers. They were just ordinary church members. But what they did to me has really made a powerful impact. Therefore, today we are going to look at David. David and Jonathan is one beautiful pair. And David and Nathan is also equally important pair. David had two people in his life who played a very key role in really fashioning him. The first person is Jonathan. Now, who is Jonathan? Now, let's take this into uh, from behind, okay? In 2 Samuel chapter 1, you find uh, Jonathan, uh, uh, David Wright sings an elegy for Jonathan and Saul. In 4 Samuel, last chapter, you find uh, Jonathan is killed with his dad in the war. And after he is killed in the war, David sings an elegy for a lament for Jonathan. And when he talks about Jonathan, this is what he says. It is so amazing to see a man talk about another person like this. Second Samuel chapter 1 and verse uh, 26. Verse 26. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. 
Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. Did you see the language? Did you see his feelings? David says and writes in this elegy, says, Jonathan, your love was more delightful to me than the love of women. What a great statement that is. Why did David write about Jonathan like this? What did Jonathan do to David? Okay, let's look at that. Jonathan was the son of Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel. Many times when we look at Saul and David, we very commonly we despise Saul. He, the Spirit of God left him and he became jealous of David. But please remember, he is not uh, an ordinary man. When he was elected to be the king, he was the guy that, the, uh, the, that Israel uh, could have chosen. If there was anybody who was eligible, that was Saul. He was the tallest among all the people. He had great ten qualities that made him the king. Okay, we are not going into that. But there came a time after David killed Goliath. In chapter 17 of First Samuel, Saul started feeling jealous about David. On the one hand, when Saul is feeling jealous, you know what Jonathan, how Jonathan is looking at him? Please remember, by this time, David is already anointed. Okay? He is already been anointed. Alright, now when he is anointed, uh, what did God expect from him? Usually when somebody is anointed, what should happen? He should immediately go to the throne, right? He should immediately go to the throne. But here it didn't happen with David. It didn't happen with David at all. God chose this man David and told uh, Saul that his kingdom was now torn. He is now totally torn. So therefore what he does is, he is now very uh, jealous of Saul, uh, of David. He is very jealous of Saul, uh, David. So what happens in chapter 18, this is the relationship between David and Jonathan. Verse, chapter 18 verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as himself. From that day Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. He loved him as himself. There is another context I want to give you here. Look at verse 4. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic, even his sword and his bow and his belt. Now please understand the context in which these people were living. What is the significance of Jonathan giving all these to David? Okay, What did he give him? He took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. What is the meaning of this? Do you have any idea? Okay, this you will understand um, if you go back to chapter 13 of uh, 1 Samuel 1 Samuel chapter 13 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 19 not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had said otherwise the Hebrews will make swords and spears so all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plowshares mattocks axes and sickles sharpened the price was two thirds of a shekel for sharpening plowshares and mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goats so on the day of the battle not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or a spear in his hand only Saul and his son Jonathan had them in the whole country there are only two people who had what Right? And what does Jonathan do in chapter 18 verse 4? He gives it off to David. Tell me how much he should love him. 
Only two people in the whole country have that weapon. And Jonathan just gives it off to David. Jonathan has every reason to feel jealous. Did you know that? He had every reason to feel jealous of David. Reason? Reason? In the words of Saul himself, you find this. You know what he says in chapter 18? In chapter 18, uh, sorry, chapter 20 and verse 31. Chapter 20 and verse 31. Saul says this to Jonathan. As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Is it not true? The next person in command, that is his son, would become the king. And the next person is Jonathan. He should become the king. And what is Jonathan doing all the time? Instead of feeling jealous about David, actually you know the father and son should uh, team up against David. But what Jonathan does here is, there are several qualities that you find here. Number one, he loved David as himself. Secondly, when his dad wanted to kill him, you know Saul tried to uh, pin David to the wall. Okay, you find this in uh, chapter 18 and verse uh, 11. And he hurled it saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. By that time already, he's eluded him twice. So he's sitting there at the dining table and then uh, Saul takes a javelin and wants to kill him. Who is this man? He's the anointed man of God. In chapter 16, you find David is anointed. Verse 13. He comes and fights against his Philistine. He kills Goliath. Saul should be very proud of David. But instead, he starts feeling jealous. And he tells his son Jonathan, Hey, as long as this David is alive, you can never become the king. We, David needs to die. Whenever there was a situation like this, in chapter 18, verse 11 we saw that. Or chapter 19, verse uh, 9 and 10. You also find this again. Verse 10, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him. As Saul drove the spear into the wall, that night David made the good his escape. So several times you find there is a tension there, there is animosity there. There is a death trap every time he faces Saul. In that situation, when his dad is about to kill him, David, when Saul is ready to kill David, you know who interferes? Jonathan interferes. Jonathan interferes there. You know what he says? Uh, chapter 19 verse 4. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. And what has he done has benefited you greatly. He is trying to drive some sense into uh, Saul's mind. Do you know what this guy did? If we had not had David today, we would have become slaves to the Philistines, to the army of Goliath. Do you recognize that dad? This boy brought us the victory and you are now feeling jealous because of him. Chapter 20. Chapter 20. Verse 32. He again takes up the cause and says, Why should he be put to death? Jonathan is challenging his dad, the king, and says, Why should David be put to death? What has he done? You know what was the result? Verse 33. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Even Jonathan fell into the same boat where his dad got angry, mad at David and Jonathan. Just imagine how stupid and how foolish Saul is in doing this. Who is Jonathan? The next king. The heir to the throne. He is his own son. Can you imagine that you are sitting at a dining table and then you try to kill your own son 
because he is trying to help a godly man. Let us say he killed Jonathan. What would have happened? He killed the heir to the throne. God protected Jonathan there too. You know what Jonathan went through in all this? Tell me one thing. When you had to face a risk because of David. Let us take Jonathan's story. Jonathan just now he escaped his dad throwing the spear at him. Now next day on would you make friendship with David? If you were Jonathan. You know what you would go and tell David? Man I love you man. But you know what? My dad, man, I almost got killed last night. I think I need to cut my ties with you. We cannot be friends anymore. I'll pray for you. I'll do whatever I can. But I cannot hang on with you. That's exactly what Jonathan would, should say. You know what he says? Oh my goodness. There's a place where David is alone with his uh, people fleeing from the Philistines. And there he comes. Jonathan comes to David and this is what he says. First Samuel chapter 23. Verse 16 And Saul son Jonathan went to David at Horish And helped him find strength in God And verse 17 is amazing Don't be afraid he said My father Saul will not lay a hand on you You will be a king over Israel And I will be second to you He's ready to give up his throne for an anointed man of God. Jonathan recognized the position of David. You know, there were times when David was running away alone like a madman, like a wanderer, like a vagabond. People don't want to associate when somebody is in that position. If you were sitting on the throne, there'd be a lot many people who will flock around you. When you're in trouble, the people who come to you are the ones, are the people like Jonathan that you need. I am so thankful to God that God has given me several Jonathans in my life. I would not hesitate to tell you. There was a time when I was very much down, very much depressed. I was struggling at that time. And one person came to my bedside and prayed in tears for me. There were people praying for me on the other end also, in their houses. But there was somebody who came with great difficulty, sat by my bedside and shed tears for me. My question for you today, this morning is, do you have a Jonathan in your life? You need a Jonathan, brothers and sisters. The other side of question that I want to flip is, are you a Jonathan to somebody? Where you could put your life on the balance. Where you could fight the cause for a godly man. Where you would not desist from making a relationship which is so divine. Even if it matters that your life is at risk there. Jonathan risked his life. For David. He was even ready to die for David. He loved David more than the throne. Tell me who would say, Hey, you be the king, I will be second. David is an ordinary shepherd boy. But Jonathan saw what David was. The two people who had the weapons, Jonathan gave his weapons to David. What a great, great love, affection that you find between Jonathan and David. His dad, his dad wanted to kill him. Jonathan gives him a sign. He shoots a, an arrow beyond and says, if you hear me telling this boy to go and pick up the arrow from beyond, it means you need to run. He protected him. And that's the reason David writes an elegy and says, Jonathan, your love is more delightful than the love of a woman. My prayer is, brothers and sisters, you need somebody who can stand by you in time of your need. 
to encourage you. We are all human beings. We all go through those emotional situations. But what a joy that would be if some Jonathan can come next to you. Pray with you. Encourage you. And rest over that fellowship. You need to have a Jonathan. Secondly, I pray and appeal that you be a Jonathan to somebody. I always pray this, Lord, when anybody comes to me, comes to my office, talks to me on the road or anywhere, when they talk to me, I want them to go so satisfied from my presence. I want to be a Jonathan to them, Lord. I want to be a Jonathan. Every time David was in danger, so Jonathan protected him. The second person that you need in your life is Nathan. Not only Jonathan, but you also need to balance it with a man called Nathan. When David wanted to build a, tab, uh, a temple for God, he tells this to Nathan. And Nathan says, no, 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 you can, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and do that. Do as you wish. God's word comes back to him and says, no, 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 he's not going to do that. Go and tell him that. So Nathan goes and tells this to David and says, you cannot build a temple. Now you must have the courage to go and tell somebody and say, hey, God told me that you cannot build the temple. Okay, David acceded to what God said and said, okay, he said, all right, Lord, you don't want me to build the, build the temple? I will not. Again, when he committed sin with Bathsheba, in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12, you find this man coming to David. In chapter 12, you find a man called Nathan, who comes to David. And verse 1 says, The Lord sent Nathan to David. And the way he puts in front of David is, he tells him a story. He tells him a story. And David's anger burned and said, that man must die. What a blessed man David was. That he had a person called Nathan, who had the courage to tell him and say, thou art that man. My dear brothers and sisters, such people might hurt you, but they fashion your spirituality. Shall, shall I tell you something? Think about this. If Nathan had not gone and told this to David, if, if David had not become angry, and if Nathan had not said, Thou art the man, you know what? We probably would not have had Psalm 51. What a powerful psalm that is. David says there, My bones are crushed. I've lost my joy. Give me me the gladness. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. He says, Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Do not cast me away from your presence or take away your Holy Spirit from me. And this is where David says, you, delight, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. This psalm is written after David felt the contrition and felt the... Uh, Conviction by the Holy Spirit. And that's when he wrote these words. And that's why God forgave him. See? God forgave him. Saul committed sin. David committed sin. But you know what happened? God forgave David. God forgave David. And then Jesus came in the line of David. He came in the line of David. You need a Nathan in your life. You need a Nathan in your life. But when you are a Nathan in somebody's life, you need to do it with love. What Nathan did was, he didn't come and 
catch his throat and then he say you are a stupid man you did this he put it very lovingly in the form of a simple story and then that was the turning point in david's life not only that nathan did some more you know what he did first chronicles 29 29 he says it says that nathan wrote the rest of the story of david in a book second chronicles 929 says he wrote the story of solomon in a book he preserved the history the lineage the historical records of those kings when i was studying this i i could a thought came to my mind there are some people who say solomon went to hell there are some people who say that now this is what i would say what you read in solomon's uh, in the bible about solomon's life is that all his life no see there is a book of nathan there are some more things that happened there have you read what happened there no let us say somebody who was a very very who led a very horrible life died the next morning you next you got a news in the morning at 6 o'clock that somebody died and you know according to his past life that he was a very very wicked man and you know that such a person would be in hell but my dear brother and sister you do not know what happened that night you do not know salvation doesn't take hours it's in the flash it happens in a flash you confess your sins with your mouth and believe in your heart you are heaven bound genuinely what if that happened to that man that night and therefore we are not supposed to judge other people never judge anybody you know what god says it is appointed for a man to die once and then the judgment god himself is not ready to judge a person before he dies therefore we should not judge anybody i learned this lesson from when i read that there is a book called the book of nathan where he wrote the life story of david and solomon we don't have it accessible to us we don't have that books with us because we don't have the access to the books doesn't mean that we can brand these people going to heaven or that those people going to hell that nathan is important in your life my prayer is that god gives you a jonathan and a nathan to balance your spiritual life and fellowship or if god wants you to be a jonathan maybe it's so if god wants you to be a nathan may it be so but you cannot forget that you need people in your fellowship you need people who can stand with you help you grow jesus christ made uh, turn the water into wine did you know in the same chapter he also made a whip the jesus who made the wine also made the whip that tells us that this is how a balanced spiritual life should be let's pray